Welcome back to Why the World Needs Anthropologists Powering the Planet. I'd like to welcome once more all four speakers of this year's event. Sophie Bully de Lesden, Bench Sykes, Veronica Strength, and Tanya Winter. And before we begin with the panel discussion, I would like to show you a video prepared in a Erasmus Plus EU project titled People-Centered Development Approaches in Practical and Learning Environments. This year's Why the World Needs Anthropologies is sponsored by the People Project and this video is, by the way, the world premiere of um, <laughs> this video. But just one more thing, please, when you're leaving the room, take this newsletter. It's a very good one. It's a result of the People Project. I can tell you it's very good because I'm here on the front page of the <laughs> newsletter. So I will leave them here. And now let's have a look at this brilliant video. Climate change and global warming create challenges that put companies under pressure to come up with new solutions for sustainable living and energy. Often, development and implementation of these innovations are dominated by technical engineering. But what about the social sciences? We need to think about the people that are meant to use these innovations and make sure that they fit their needs, everyday life and practice. People-centered development does just that. It keeps in mind that people should be an indispensable part of industrial development processes. With the People Project we address this, as well as the underemployment of graduates of social science studies. In four European countries, we connect interdisciplinary groups of students, industry professionals and educators to work on real-life business challenges in sustainable living and energy. This allows social science students to develop practical competences towards employability, helps industry professionals integrate social science expertise in their practice, and enables educators to develop better engaged social science learning in higher education. The key innovative contribution of the People Project is the implementation of people-centered learning cycles. These consist of several phases. In the first phase, we prepare all team members. Industry professionals share their business challenges, students formulate their research plan, and together they follow a training on people-centered development. In the second phase, research begins. Students conduct field work amongst people relevant to their case study. Citizens, residents, consumers, men, women, children. Our students interview and observe them, get to know their needs, habits, and lifestyles, and actively involve them in the development process. Next up is the analysis. What does the data tell us? What is relevant for people when it comes to sustainable living and energy? Our students write their thesis and they formulate their recommendations in a fit for industry product, sharing their research and results with academia and industry. Finally, all European participants in the People Project come together to exchange ideas and share their results and experiences during a two-day co-creation camp enabling an even stronger and broader collaboration between higher education and industry. Are you interested in people? Do you want to know more about people-centered approaches and co-creation between education and industry? Go to our website and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you very much for the applause. The video explains that the development of innovative energy solutions, at the beginning, this narrator says, that the development of the solutions is dominated by technical engineering. So first question for Bench. What about social sciences? And how do you plan to include anthropologists and other social scientists in development teams of Donk Energy and other companies? Well, that's a very interesting question. I, I suppose I, uh, the answer is I don't know yet. Um, I'm kind of hoping in the next 90 minutes we're going to hear the answer to all my questions that I pose at the beginning of this conference. Um, but as I, as I said at the beginning, uh, it's very clear that we can only get so far with technology, and we do recognize that. We know that the technology journey isn't over, but 
the, the, the energy transition will need uh, integration of social sciences. I think for us as a company that generates electricity, our, our real sort of on the doorstep, if you like, challenges that are right in front of us are in relation to um, engaging communities where we're building generating assets. Um, but in terms of opening up, uh, if you like, unlocking the opportunities for more um, renewable generation, which means more generation that isn't dispatchable, that needs more intelligent consumer behaviour, um, I think that's absolutely something that, that, that we'll have to engage with. Uh, and so I suspect it'll be more as an, as an industry rather than as individual businesses. And certainly system managers, system regulators, such as National Grid and Ofgem in the UK, will be key to engaging beyond the technical. And another question, quick one for you. How can we make a switch from the expert mindset of engineers to the people-centered mindset for designing socially meaningful and environmentally relevant energy solutions. Because it is quite a switch. It's similar to a transition yeah. to a different energy, right? Yeah, I, I, that, very true. And it is a big, big challenge. I suppose it's incumbent on me and others in positions like me, like mine, to get out there and explain to my peers, my, my colleagues, that their engineering brilliance will only get us so far. Um, I have personally the opportunity, because I, I do some industry-wide activity, to, to push this agenda, which I do. Um, and, and certainly working with the Durham Energy Institute, again, is, is, is a great vehicle to push this. I, I don't think there's an easy answer to the question, though. I don't think suddenly all the engineers are going to wake up and think, oh, do you know what, I need to talk to a social scientist this morning, um, unless they happen to be sitting next to one. But probably we need also more pushers from outside, uh, from our side, from anthropological yeah, side. Yeah, and not I, only I do from think the there's a real side. opportunity for, an, for, for the social sciences and anthropologists to talk the language of the technologists. Uh, and create a sort of common language. And I think common language can be a very powerful unifier of thinking and, and, and if you like, coalescing of ideas. So um, very interesting. I, I wasn't in the room, but I was enjoying the live stream for the last couple of presentations. Um, and I found them fascinating. And I also realized we all have our jargon, don't we? Um, and, and they were relatively jargon-free, and I did my best to be jargon-free, but there's no doubt we all speak the language of the world that we live in, and we can be quite introspective, and that makes it very hard, I think, to bring the, the different thinking, uh, the different mindsets together, and finding that common language is, is probably key to unlocking that relationship. So on our side, we have to start learning these acronyms, FMS, OBD, and words like terawatts, Kilojoules. Yeah, you've got to know your kilojoules from your gigawatt hours, absolutely. All yeah. right. <laughs> Sophie, uh, what are, in your opinion, you presented some of them, the current obstacles uh, for anthropologists not working more in the energy industry? And how do they look at you? You also already spoke earlier a little bit about it. Uh, because you're a part of an organization where the engineering mindset probably prevails. So what is your position in the company and how do they, how do the others look at you? <laughs> I confess that um, it's fine. We work well together. And it's very interesting because we don't have the same culture with engineers. And sometimes they're really fascinated by what we can say. We, we're quite surprised that we can have such an input. Because um, um, some engineers and I don't want to be in the stereotype, but they, they're very <laughs> focused on uh, the efficiency of uh, a device, of uh, the efficiency of uh, technical things. Uh, but uh, efficiency is not enough. You, you have uh, uses. And uh, so uh, when uh, we talk together and we, when we explain to them that uh, um, uh, technical devices are not magic things that will solve everything in terms of managing energy and managing uh, and uh, achieving the energy transition, uh, we can give some uh, solution and some recommendation, as we saw with Tanya in another context. Uh, Tanya, in your interview for Anthropologia 2.0, you said something really interesting, which was mentioned also during your lecture. 
anthropologists and engineers overlap in that they share a concern for observing and understanding the real or empirical world. Since you know both worlds, we're not that different after all, right? <laughs> I'm not schizophrenic, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, we work with the somehow grounded research, whether it's uh, people, technology, yes, we, we, we deal with the, the concrete world. But if I can comment um, on the film we just saw, um, to me, that, that, is, that is a film that is good to show to engineers because it somehow shows them that, yes, we need, we need uh, insight in people for doing the good uh, solutions for technology. If I'm a little bit critical, and we are allowed to be as academics, um, it somehow presents the user as um, the one that is going to accommodate the technology change. You, as long as we, you know, we, we should understand them so that they should use the technology we know is good for the environment. And I think we can be more ambitious than that. And especially because I thought it was very interesting what you brought up, both uh, Sophie and... Um, Bench. Bench, sorry. Um, I mean, the, the future is very much about the, you know, the, the combat um, for autonomy. Who's going to decide? Who's, who's going to take control? That's the key, also key, going to be a key issue in the technology framework. So I think um, it's a good film to show then, the engineers for showing that um, Anthropologists are needed in a little bit the same way as for the, the development report 2012. The, the World Bank argued that we need to, or governments need to, to focus on women because it will produce economic growth. So it's a kind of this is a, a, a goal or a means towards a, an end. And in the same way, we've presented here with people, knowing people to have the right technology. But for these issues of control, autonomy, uh, social justice, I think we should be having two two thoughts uh, at the same time. So being pragmatic to have you know to get to to into the um, the, the the important arenas for for influencing policy, but at the same time having a more ambitious social agenda for also who's going to be in power in the future. And you're right. Uh, we have this quite stereotypical image in our heads who, for example, users are. And this is also one of the problem of development of new solutions. I mean, engineers and or companies start developing new solutions for imaginary uh, user who does not perhaps even exist and create some kind of fictive personas, so-called personas, instead of going in the field and asking these actual people, what kind of problems do you have? Uh, what do you need? do you need the solutions that we are making for you? But the problem is actually uh, even deeper. So uh, people have also a skewed uh, image about anthropologists. And here's a question for you, Ver Veronica, because you're a specialist in this field. Uh, at the beginning of your book, what anthropologists do, you explain that people still imagine anthropologists, I will quote here, as with helmet wearing colonial adventurers living with hidden tribes in the jungle, or alternatively, crime busting forensic anthropologists who always find the murderer. <laughs> it's uh, or option three: bearded sandals with socks, obsessive going bonkers somewhere in the outback. So I haven't seen much socks and sandals today, I must admit. However, I agree that stereotypical image of anthropologists is a problem, also for getting a job outside academia. How can we get rid of this stereotypical image? Or should we maybe use it as a competitive advantage and put socks and sandals in our anthropological coat of arms? Thank you, thank you, Dan. That's a lovely question about stereotypes. But actually, stereotypes are really interesting um, because, I mean, we, there's lots of lovely stereotypes in every disciplinary area. And we like to think the academy is immune from them, but of course it's not. We all tend to have sets of expectations about how other disciplines think, what they value, what they're interested in, and so forth. And also a stereotype of the academy itself as somehow being outside the real world. Now, I would like to challenge this notion that there's a real world in which we are not involved. Uh, those of us who, of course, who work with indigenous communities see a lot more chalk face in the real world than some of our hedge fund managers who run the university and tell us that academics don't live in the real world. 
Um, and it's not useful because what it suggests is that there's theory and thinking in the academy and then there's practical problem solving outside it. And as I hope I made clear earlier, we need the theoretical toolkits for understanding the complex problems which human societies are facing. So I'd like to do away with the notion of the real world being somewhere else than where we are. And I'd like to comment a little bit on, on the notion of equality, because one of the things that the stereotypes make very clear is that we have a very um, rigidly uh, steep disciplinary hierarchy. And, and there are certain disciplines which expect to be the decision makers, the leaders in projects. And one of the things I have tried as chair of the Association of Anthropologists to do is to say to anthropologists, step up. Don't be afraid to lead projects. Don't be afraid to ask for equality. Because those of us who work with hydrologists and engineers for many years often find you're supposed to come on at some later stage of the game on half a day a week while everyone else is full time and magically inject the people thing into the equation and um, like some kind of shaman, you know, poof, here's the people stuff. Uh, when actually running an interdisciplinary research institute for five years has taught me some very important things about how interdisciplinarity should work. Imagine if these problems were approached with equality between disciplines at the very beginning, how differently they would be conceived and thought through and the different kinds of solutions that emerge. And I loved the video, but I wanted to say, well, okay, so where are the people speaking for the non-human in this? I love the idea of a co-creation camp. It sounds a bit naughty, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds like fun, sort of swingy. But, but, but I noticed that there were no non-human things in it. They were, where are the biologists? Where are the ecologists? Where are the people speaking for the bugs and the microbes and all the rest? Imagine if you put them together at the very beginning and said, OK, let's have these different perspectives coming into the equation right from the start and what they need and what their interests are. And I've been trying to design a lever hume project that does that. It looks at a river catchment. It's got 17, 18 different disciplines involved. And they're going to speak for each part of the catchment. But more importantly, they're going to have equality. Those voices are going to be treated equally. And you can do that with a research institute. You can go, OK, Levy goes at the door. Things are equal in here. And different things happen. Different things happen. So I'm listening to the language about the people-centeredness and the notion that um, anthropologists are going to be integrated into an engineering process. And I'm thinking, well, why? <laughs> why are we going to be integrated into a process that's already formed? Why aren't we forming this process together? Thank you very much for this brilliant answer. Uh, are there any questions, by the way, from the audience? Because we would like to include you as early as possible in this debate. We don't want to be exclusive <laughs> or elitistic or anything else. Uh, hello, I'm Leonard Anderson. I'm one of the partners in the um, People Project. Um, and I'm a fan of demand-side response. Right, so this question is really to um, the suppliers of energy, right? because demand-side response should reduce costs to consumers. It's currently mostly at the industrial level. Um, but I'm interested in demand-side response for SMEs and uh, domestic, which is a huge part of where you're making money, I assume. Uh, and... Um, from both sides, right? Um, what incentives can you give to people to change? What should we do? What are the first steps to take when something isn't currently available? How do you encourage, how do you help innovation forward when you can't buy the products that would enable it? I guess with, with, what, with the wallet, you make it worthwhile to develop the technologies and to commercialise the technologies because there's a, there's a reason to do it commercially, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your view of how the market works. Um, so we are doing quite a bit on demand-side response, but it's with large industrials because we're a large, we generate in, in large chunks and we, we stop generating in large chunks, so it doesn't really work with small, uh, and small business and domestic customers. But I, I, w I mean, demand-side response, I did touch on it in terms of all of the things that are going to go on in our homes and our cars, deciding what they're going to do with the electricity that's in them. So all of that kind of um, distributed 
um, demand side response is absolutely coming. How you make it happen faster, I think, is by creating a regulatory environment that, that drives uh, the demand for that. Uh, and it doesn't exist yet. Uh, and that's largely because we can't do minute by minute pricing just yet, or we're not ready to put it that way. And that's what will, I think, really drive um, the, the lower level DSR. I'm not a supplier, but uh, I represent one, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, um, EDF and many experiments about demand side management and uh, the financial side, it's a wallet, as you said, is one, one aspect of the question, but you can't make people change uh, all their way of life because of money. There's a, also driven... Uh, driven things like citizens' awareness uh, sensitivities and, uh, um, and for example, there are some places in France where uh, the, um, the grid is quite uh, so many, uh, no, not so many, I should, many, uh, but tension on the grid because like in the south, in the in re PACA region, or in Brittany, there's some tension on the region. And uh, if you uh, you send uh, SMS to people, they, they just uh, turn turn off the, the light and uh, make things like this. So it's a kind of demand response, uh, which means that uh, people are not only concerned by money. Money, of course, uh, they, they have a bill to pay at the end of the month. Um, but uh, you, you can make um, o o other solution, and like a community too, and to our games, uh, the one who will uh, earn the, the, some coins and uh, um, coins, uh, not, not real coins, I mean. Uh, and uh, after, uh, I think that we spoke about the control, and uh, it's very important for people to 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 see that, that uh, their action have an impact, and this impact m may be on the bill, but this impact may be on the environmental and on the locality on on their territory. Thank you, Sophie. Um, let's get back to some figures and facts. Another question? Okay, let's take one more question and then we'll move to figures and facts because anthropologists are well known to like figures and graphs and numbers. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Buckler. I'm course leader for a master's in corporate social responsibility at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. Um, my particular interest is in the relationship between big business, development, governments, um, also local content regulations, particularly local content regulations in the developing world, and whether investment in different forms of capital can generate shared capital. And what I'd like to know are your thoughts on whether there can be a genuine shift towards better access to energy, for the poorest communities, whether there can be a genuine solution to the energy dilemma, given the global capitalist economy, given the needs of big business to make a profit, given the way that international finance works, can there be a solution? And if so, how might it start to come about? Because at the moment, it seems to work against the solutions, sometimes. Could you please say for whom is this question? Or was it just a comment? It's, I, w I would be interested on, in hearing everybody's thoughts. I think everybody would have something potentially relevant. So to we say. will give word to Tom. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I can respond based on my experience from Kenya, where we have tried to compare centralized and decentralized solutions. And where we say that the government is, is uh, still trying to extend the grid, but it's not reaching the villages. So it's standing there without being used. Whereas the private sector is coming now massively in, offering also pay-as-you-go for service and so on. So also reaching rather poor groups. So there is a, and, and that, that is going on in a, at a high speed at the moment. So, but, but what we see is missing in this picture is the public uh, energy as a public good. And what about, you know, the community level to, to um, ensure you know, productive activities, both healthcare, all, all these things in the remote areas, they don't even have a, you know, working clin clinic. 
So that is where we argue that government should, maybe if you think about the micro credit as a kind of individual, it's a, it's a kind of success story to many, that they had, it had effect in terms of uh, where you had these groups, you know, groups-based um, financing. So if we think, think more in terms of uh, empowering villages on the village level or community level, but where the government absolutely need to be present, because the, 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 there are some, you know, individual projects and so on, but they are very fragile, so when the donor leaves, you know, it, it, go, it dissolves easily. So, so we try to argue that the government needs also to look at the village level. They don't want to go to rural areas even, you know, but you need to, <laughs> to be there because people live there. Mm. Thank you. Okay, facts and figures now. Um, by the way, every day we use more than a million terajoules of energy. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Neither can I. I mean... Nobody can imagine that what is a million terajoules of energy. But if we translate it to a more uh, understandable language, so it is um, comparable to what uh, we would use if each of us, each of 7.5 billion people in this planet, boiled 70 kettles of water per hour around the clock. So this sounds a bit different now, right? And the problem is that some of us boil 200 or more kettles of water per hour, while there are people in the planet who boil 30, 20, or even one kettle of water per hour. So uh, the energy consumption is definitely not, not shared equally in this planet. And there are still many people who use simple stoves or open fires to burn wood, animal, dunk, coal. Have you got from both sides, anthropological and engineering science, any suggestions how to solve the energy inequality problem? How can we use anthropologists here? Maybe again for Tanya? <laughs> so how to solve the major problem of the world, in short. Um, yes. <laughs> um, maybe we should stop thinking so much about the difference between north and south, you know, in research, and because we we use the same frameworks, and we so there's a question of you know we have to have production, we have to have trans uh, transport, and it should be taking uh, nature and future generations into account, but. But we, uh, but the way we, the, what we need energy, energy for is it's getting more and more the similar issues with with computers, mobiles, and so on. So for consumption side, I think we we should maybe um, avoid thinking that people are so different in the south compared to England. You know, so we are we have the very much the same needs. And if I can take a little anecdote from Zanzibar, when I was I was so impressed with my uh, one of my na neighbors when she was boiling the kettle, and she was boiling water and she filled up the thermos. And every time she did this, it was the perfect amount of water that went into the thermos. And, and I, was, I said to her, I'm impressed how, how good you are at measuring. Because when I boil my tea, I always boil too much water and I, you know, there's always something remaining. Oh, but Tanya, of course I measure first the thermos and then I, pour the, and I, I boil the amount that is needed. You know, so it's just a reminder to me that yes, we have things to learn the other way around too. So, but I don't know if I solved completely the, the energy dilemma, but, um, but I think just looking at the perspectives, I mean, uh, looking at, um, yes, across, no, not dividing the world too much. And not, not only that we use different amounts of energy in different countries, uh, we also perceive energy in a different way. Uh, for example, in an article that Sophie and Tanya prepared together, um, you explain that in Norway, electricity perceived to be cheap, safe, and clean, probably because of the uh, hydro energy. On the other hand, in France, energy could be perceived as risky, both economically and in physical sense, probably also due to the nuclear plants. And here in the UK, uh, energy is closely connected to, the, to coal, I suppose. So coal was the main source of energy in the past. So how can we use such mental images uh, for promoting alternative energy sources and to make this switch from um, 
carbon to non-carbon energy sources. Perhaps Bench. I have no idea how to answer that question. Um, I, I, I'm not an anthropologist, but I, for me, it, it's about what what gets people to change the way they behave and, and the way they perceive things. And uh, interestingly, the the switch away from coal becomes much more interesting now. We talk about soxes and noxes, and much less about CO2, because it's much more immediate for people. Um, people can see the statistics of how many tens of thousands of people we kill every year with pollution. They can't see the, the, the travesty that's coming with climate change a few decades down the road. So I suppose for me, in a very simplistic, non-anthropological sense, it's just about making, making the need for change much more real and much more immediate than um, simply saying, you know, we've got to worry about the planet for our grandchildren. Um, that doesn't tend to get people very motivated. Yes, so what we did by comparing France and Norway in that case, we showed also that the, there, is a, there are EU regulations, you know, the guarantees for origin, how people re expected to respond to given uh, regulation. And what we show that this, the, the responses are very different in different countries. So Norway, uh, Norwegians are not interested in buying that because the energy is green, is our rivers, is common good, very, you know, very relaxed. Whereas the French are a paranoia, you know, afraid of nuclear, afraid of fires. There's always, you know, afraid of economy. So they, that was very interesting to compare. And we, sh we tried to show that the same policy has different implications in these different countries. And in effect, Norway is, we are selling double the renewable value because in Germany, people are buying the guarantees issued by Norwegian power. And Norwegians think they are consuming uh, green electricity. So in a way, it shows that that policy is not working very well in a Norwegian context. Now, what, based on what Sophie said today on the, on the what, that the French who go for solar energy, they want to become autonomous and, and distance themselves from the grid and the system and the state. In Norway, we find the opposite thing, that when they, want, when they pr start to produce solar energy, they want to connect to the grid, to, to be able to contribute to the common good. So again, there is this, there's the kind of cultural input for how people are actually responding in this shift towards renewables. And the, of course, the, the, to, to, and as a recommendation to policy and how we can use this knowledge is that, no, we, the, that the policy should also have this, 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 this type of focus. So having general regulations for the whole of Europe is, might not work very well, but, but looking more specifically to what to what uh, the country, the, both from the culture both, and also the production side. That's what we advise. But even if you make, I don't know, this kind of switch, you've made it already in Norway, I suppose, because you use, uh, you produce most of energy from hydro yeah. sources. Everything. Okay, you still sell a lot of energy abroad, right? You're the sixth largest, you, I mean, the Norway is the sixth largest uh, producer of oil in the world. Um, but even if you make this kind of switch locally and then the country such as the USA decides to step out of the uh, Paris Agreement and to go on a completely um, carbon uh, loaded way again. I mean, does it make any sense, you know, for countries like, I don't know, Norway, Slovenia, uh, Latvia to make, to try to make this kind of shift? I mean, the big players are saying no to um, this kind of transition. C can I just make one comment that um, we have a business in offshore wind in the US. It's steaming ahead. Maybe that's not quite the right phrase to use, is it? Um, but it's, it's pushing ahead. Um, and co coal is dead in the US, not because of policy, but because of cost. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. There are better ways of generating electricity. And so uh, in the place where the dollar is king, um, it, it will, coal will not come back. It doesn't matter what um, the White House decides, actually. So, in the end, um, I think there are, there are good reasons why countries like Norway, the UK, want to take a lead in um, decarbonizing. Um, it's going to be a, a smart move. I think it probably already is. But I don't think um, coal is going to come back just because someone, someone has an ideological uh, love of it. 
I think there's some very interesting things to look at in this conversation about how people are conceptualizing the different material ways of producing energy and attaching different meanings to things like coal and water and solar energy and so forth. But one of the things that strikes me is that we're not really locating uh, or bringing to the surface the kind of ideological underpinnings that are driving the consumer choices that people are making and we're talking about inequalities. But the general discourse about equality is that, that societies who currently don't enjoy high levels of affluence should be brought up to the same kinds of patterns of energy use that everybody else has. And we're still very hooked into an underlying notion that growth is good. And it's very hard to say that growth isn't good because it seems like an intrinsically good thing, but it's clearly not sustainable. There's a very interesting piece by Ivan Illich about the shadow our future throws. And basically what he says, well, sustainable development is an oxymoron because we cannot continue to expand. Um, and when we start talking about human behavior and changing human behavior, we're really talking about the kind of things that people value. What do they want to do with their time and their lives and in their material worlds? But in order to have growth, you have to have consumers. You have to keep enlarging consumption. And so it's necessary, therefore, to locate this discussion in its ideological base, which is fundamentally a competitive system of, of, of based on growth. And, and we should be really looking very carefully at degrowth economics and ways to achieve more steady state types of economies. And then you get a sort of relationship between that and the kind of values of energy use that are being promoted in terms of the life ways that people have, so that people might value time and fun together, maybe one of those co-creation camps, rather than going shopping to get more plastic stuff that they don't really need. And, and it's only because we need to keep selling that plastic stuff to keep this expansive system going that people are being encouraged to value going shopping instead of going playing. So I think we need to get down deeper to the values beyond simple attitudes to energy use and start thinking about what we're really encouraging people to value as a way of life. And then it becomes possible to equalize those um, massive disparities in affluence, perhaps a little more readily. Um, yes, what you say, I totally agree. And I, it is, reminds me of Mary Douglas, whom you mentioned. Uh, she explains the, the dynamics of consumption very well, saying that we need things, objects, to include people in our lives. That's, that's the, you know, the, the bottom goal that we have as humans. So I think it's you know, such an important secret that is kept, still kept a secret. So the, the day we discover that, we don't need everything, all the goods. But it's easy to speak and more difficult to do the change because also degrowth and the switch to the cleaner uh, energy causes, can cause and causes many social problems which can be seen, seen not only on the global level but also very locally like here in Durham County for example and in other mining areas uh, throughout the UK and also throughout uh, the world. So how can we use anthropology again to make this switch easier and people's lives less miserable. So we, you I mean, and we have experienced from the past that the switch is not easy and we get many social problems out of the switch, out of, the, of transition to new energy. Well, I guess the question is, do we want our social problems in the short term or in the long term? Um, because, you know, yes, you're right. It's hugely disruptive to think about how to shift economies into a non-growth kind of pattern. But the, the question really is what's going to happen if we don't? Um, and, and in a sense, a lot of the problems that we're seeing are the, are the product of unsustainable growth falling over. So, you know, in some ways we're seeing these things already because you get environments so degraded they can no longer be productive. So, yeah, it, it's really more a question of do we only deal with problems in immediate, in immediate terms or do we try to also think ahead and, and think about how to shift to more sustainable patterns? I think we need to do both, but you might want to comment on that. I've got two, I can speak in stereo. <laughs> yeah, as a, com as a complete uh, anth anthropological novice, 
I'm fascinated by the idea of, um, what do you call it, negative growth, was it? Or degrowth, well, shrinkage. <laughs> yeah. Well, not necessarily beyond a certain point. I mean, if you look at human societies long term, if you take the big mm. point of view, human societies have had steady state economies for most of their history. You know, you've had steady, oh, sorry, um, you've had economies that didn't expand. I mean, Jared Diamond suggests that, that agriculture is humankind's worst mistake. <laughs> which is a little controversial, but his argument was it allowed societies to um, get stuck into a growth pattern of expanding their populations, expanding their needs, then having to go and taking other people's land and resources. And so you get the sort of expansion intensification pattern. But actually, for 90-something percent of human history, that isn't how it worked. You had economies that, that limited their growth, that limited their population, and which therefore... So, I mean, if you look at Aboriginal society in Australia, it sustained itself for 60,000 years. It's taken European Australians 200 years to wreck that environment with a growth-based economy. So it's not as if we don't know how to do this stuff. We just don't know how to do it with the size population that we now have. And that's why the issue of population is the great white elephant in the room, because it's something that no politician dares to talk about. And yet... It is, of course, the biggest driver of those expansion, expansion, expansion. Well, we've run out of planet. We've stopped having room to steal other people's continents. And now we're talking about how to steal bits of space. But, that, you know, there is a finite limit there. So if we can start thinking about how to be working within that limit, then we'd have to talk about maybe a global one-child policy, maybe really thinking about scaling down the material culture that we produce, maybe thinking about different kinds of life ways. And all of that stuff is going to be forced on us eventually anyway, so we might as well start doing it the way that we think will work. So contraception might be the solution, if I understand you correctly, for the, for the energy problems. Oh, I could tell you that electrification could be a solution, because so many studies show that when you have electricity, fertility rates drop. The same thing, the opposite things happen when there's a power cut for two weeks, baby boom, nine months later. This, is, <laughs> this, is, uh, this has been documented. And, but I mean, seriously, I mean, development is, is cause, if you have development, the number of children uh, is reduced. So, okay, if we give up the development ambition, I would agree with you, but I, I will not give up development. And I think that is the solution to the, to the population problem. And I must admit, maybe I'm even a product of this kind of measures because we had in uh, ex-Yugoslavia reduc electricity reductions every week or once per month and at that time fertility rates uh, grew really rapidly. Um, more questions from the audience. Yeah, we have many hands up. When we get to reproduction, it becomes interesting. <laughs> okay, first, the... Man in the middle. So this uh, comment or question goes a lot to um, mostly what Veronica was talking about with the growth and the economic growth about how societies up until recently used to limit themselves in terms of their environment. So it's interesting with Jared Diamond's argument because in the Intro to Biological Anthropology courses I used to teach, we always had them read that article as a way of thinking about humans and the environment and how it worked out and the um, problems with that. But as a species, it's making the argument that humans would live in an environment that they would only use enough of their resources and then leave the rest. But uh, within hominoids, we know that that's not true. Uh, chimpanzees recently caused a localized extinction of the red colobus monkey because of overhunting. You find any time that there's competition between species or between a species and in its environment that um, one of a couple things happen. One, there's localized extinction. Two, there's character displacement, so you uh, go to different ecological niches. Or three, um, one leaves that area. So. From a biological perspective, it seems that no species has ever been able to solve this problem of just using enough of the resources. So, uh, how can humans do that? For whom is the question? Uh, Veronica. <laughs> this is a lovely question. Uh, yes. 
Um, I think it's a very good point because I have become sufficiently okay with sort of biological anthropology and evolutionary anthropology to, to accept that humans, like other species, have expansive tendencies. I think all species do, and usually it gets worked out when they crash into each other and populations simply fall over. Um, but with humans, we do have a little more choice. We have reflexive consciousness. We have choices. I mean, it, you know, people use the word, uh, term civilization and development in very different sorts of ways. And for me, I would separate growth and development because I think there's lots of different ways to think about what development could mean. And it's not necessarily shackled to growth. And secondly, um, you know, we do have the choice of being able to have these kinds of conversations and elucidate these issues and make different choices, which perhaps other species don't have quite so readily. And one of the other things that we have in our generation, which humans have never had, is the capacity for global conversations via this very wonderful technology that companies like Dong produce. You know, 100 years ago, it would take a very long time to get a letter and have a discussion between countries about how we might collaborate together. Now, we can do this instantaneously, and so those conversations can flow around the world. So I actually think we have quite a lot of choice. Um, we just have to think a little bit outside the box and think, well, maybe development doesn't have to look like more and more stuff. Maybe it just means being more and more civilized in some very interesting ways. Yes? Thank you. Uh, just a comment uh, and a question, but first a comment about uh, Norway and um, hydropower and energy use. Norway hasn't really gone through a switch in that sense because our country is built on hydropower as the main energy source. Um, it was that allowed for a lot of the expansion and particularly the industrial expansions in Norway as well. So it's not a switch in that sense, but then we have been and we still are major oil exporters. Um, so it's a kind of, it's a different thing. But then now we are building a lot of renewable energy as well to export to Europe. And this is where my question comes in, in terms of energy justice, because some of that um, is both, what do you say, impacting the non-human dimensions and also human dimensions. Uh, one example is that we've had this green energy certificates where a lot of our streams that have, are not yet part of the higher power complex are becoming part of it and all the a lot of the smaller ones and so it's impacting biodiversity and and uh, non-human actors and it's in part of um, the middle of Norway near Trondheim we're building um, Startkraft actually and uh, a local uh, energy company are building in reindeer herding territory and so they're also impacting the rights of the reindeer herders in the South Sami area to uh, who will lose a third of their grazing areas, and then also that will impact their culture and their possibility of carrying their indigenous culture onwards to the next generation. So there were all these other issues to come up when Norway is trying to expand their renewable energy that looks green, but it actually might be uh, unsustainable in many ways. So the question is, what, how can we think about energy justice in ways that, that include these perspectives and handle them in a good way? For whom is the question? Uh, I think to the entire panel. All right, <laughs> pick two. <laughs> <laughs> to Veronica, but also. <laughs> okay. okay, actually I think this is a really interesting set of points about community engagement and community ownership. I think one of the things that disempowers people in terms of behavioral change is, is that they feel enmeshed in systems in which they don't really have ownership of the process. And if you look at the successes that have been achieved with community-owned energy schemes, they tell you some very important things about people's capacities to engage in long-term relationships with places and each other, <laughs> and therefore to invest in a common good type of approach more readily. And of course, those of you who, who read Economists will know Eleanor Ostrom's work on common property regimes, in which these kinds of dynamics are shown that when people have long-term relationships with places and each other, they will invest in more longer-term thinking. And you get this very strongly from, for example, your Sami groups who have that kind of community, locally based identity and ownership. But the ownership issue is key. If people don't own where they live and the resources and their systems and their infrastructure, how do they then develop um, those kinds of relationships with places that allow those kinds of values to 
be given priority. So you come back to notions about property and regulation and so forth. But I'm sure that mm. others will have things to say. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you. I have a P new PhD student who's going to look at the Sami on a, in the win windmill area. So we must talk, Susanna Norman. Um, but to me, to me, what you know, what we can do is a large question. But at least having knowledge about how these, you know, the effects on people and getting the other perspectives, as Veronica is talking about, getting them out, and then our, the, the the challenge is how we communicate those back to policymakers in the media. That's where we should put emphasis, not putting that report or thesis in a drawer. But that's when we should start uh, going out. But first, knowledge. Would Sophie and Bench like to add anything? to the question. Very briefly, and again, with no anthropological perspective. Um, I think there's, a, there's an interesting question that it does raise uh, about choices, because there is no way of generating electricity that has no impact on people and the environment. Mm -hmm. So we have to make choices, and I'm not saying that this particular project of Statcrafts is the right one or the wrong one, but from our own experience, we know that, um, you know, to, to coin a phrase, you can't make an omelette without cracking eggs. Um, we deal with a lot of um, human societies, but also a lot of uh, ecological actors, if you like, biodiversity and, you know, cetaceans, sea mammals, uh, birds, all, all of these are, are important factors. And so there's a lot of... Um, it, I guess it's just not as simple as we don't like development, I would say. You know, if we want to have clean um, uh, and sustainable society, then we need to find ways of generating electricity for it, and there are no uh, pain-free options. I don't know how you, you assess the impact on the Sami communities versus the impact on flooding another fjord or whatever it might be, um, but I, I guess, you know... It's, it's difficult to look at one thing in isolation because the, the counterfactual is perhaps doing something that's um, even worse. Another question, yes? Hi there, my name is Mark Robinson. Um, I'm a spy. I'm not an anthropologist. Um, I'm an international relations person from the School of Government and International Affairs just up the road. So I'm not a very successful spy because I tell everybody that I'm actually <laughs> spying. And I'm here with all the people I convinced from the department to come with me today. Um, so my role really is to tell you about the best pub and the best restaurant in Durham. And if you don't like my question, I won't tell you. Um, I've enjoyed today very much, and I'm, I'm very passionate about energy and science projects. But part of this discussion has driven me a bit kind of crazy. Because I've spent quite a bit of time in China uh, and in northern India. And for, if you like, we, we live like princes and princesses, and for an elite, which is what we are in the world, to hint that growth is a bad thing, to me, is immoral. It's growth that's taken people in China and India out of abject poverty. They're not in our fantastic world yet, but they're getting there. So we need world growth. And for us to also say you shouldn't do this to Indians or to Chinese when we've been doing it since the Industrial Revolution is also, I think, very elitist. And that's not my question. That's just getting that off my chest. Um, I've worked on a huge science project. Um, it involves India and China, Japan, South Korea, Russia, the United States of America, and Europe. It's the biggest science project in the world. It's based in a beautiful part of the world. It's based in Cadarache in Provence, in France. It's completely green energy production. It's the future, I would say, for world power. But it involves a word, and my question is about stereotypes. And when I mention this seven-letter word, word, I think in this room all the anthropologists will say it's bad. Mark's telling us it's good, but it's bad. Because it's nuclear. It's nuclear fusion, which of course is completely different to nuclear fission. So my question is, and I suppose it's for Sophie, you know, I think anthropologists, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've known you for a day or half a day, could I boldly suggest that one role anthropologists could do is when you look at a super duper green energy project like nuclear fusion, you don't stereotype it because it's got that rude word in it, but you embrace it the same way that Greenpeace are doing now 
and saying that nuclear fusion is the future and you can tell people all about this project. It's ITER.org, I-T-E-R.org. It's wonderful. And so my question is to Sophie. Do you agree anthropologists should not stereotype things because it has one bad word in? What do you say to that? Yes, I Yes. <laughs> we agree. We agree. We agree. Um, the question with nuclear, because it's not, uh, uh, um, it's not an anthropologist, uh, Answer, I give. As you say, there's no no neutral choice. As nuclear has no carbon emission, so it's a little bit touchy when we speak about it because for the environment is not so bad in that way. Um, um, but uh, there's no no choice that has no impact on the environment, so um, I will... Just, just to clarify, there's, there's nothing to do with fission. It doesn't use any nuclear waste mm -hmm. in the way that fission does. There is, but I yeah, there is no I fission. I'm not don't engineer, think fission. So this is nothing to do so with uh, what you think <laughs> nuclear is about. I, I'm not an engineer. Yeah. I don't know this it's project. Fusion. So it's I the same way a, that the sun an makes energy. On it. You see, There's I'm no not, uh, fission. I don't want to hear from the wind person. Please, I don't want I to hear. I, I don't know why you've got a, a downer on wind. I, I think nuclear fusion is wonderful when it's affordable. Good, yeah. good answer. Yeah, and as a student of engineering, we heard about that technology, you know, 30 yeah. years ago. And it, but they say we don't know when it will become. So congratulations if it's here. It's really. I so you need to it. log on iter.org. I t e r dot org. Thank you. We have another question on the other side. Well, while he's taking the microphone across, I thought I might respond to your, the steam coming out of your ears <laughs> about the elite thing, because I think it's actually a really important point that the wealthy Western societies do not preach to the, those who are not living like princesses, as you so rightly put it. But one of the things that I'm very conscious of is the fact that we should be looking at ourselves and our practices because one of the reasons of those inequalities is that we are stripping the poorer and the more arid parts of the world of their resources in order to have that lifestyle. And the people paying the costs are not us. They're those people who haven't got basic water and sanitation. And those populations of non-humans who haven't got what they need either. And so, I, for me, the distribution of inequality is, is, isn't a question of the elite preaching, it's the question of the elite giving up some of the things that it has in order to spread the affluence much more evenly. Your nuclear thing is really interesting because it, it also raises the question of non-judgmentalism, which I think is very important in looking at technologies. What we should be asking is not whether it has a stereotypical word that we all want to jump up at about, but what are the costs and benefits to all of the actors involved? And, and that comes back to your point about ecological actors. You know, when we're assessing different technologies, the real question should be who's gaining, who's losing, and are there limits that we need to place on both of those ends of the spectrum? And this will be one of the final questions. Yeah, it's not really a question. I just want to bring the topic back to what anthropologists can do and just highlight a project that's based in Copenhagen, which is looking at the nuclear physics of the large um, colliders. So anthropologists can be useful in relation to nuclear physics as well as uh, engineering parts of energy. We'll take one more question, yes? Who's faster now? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is to the whole panel, but in particular to the energy companies represented. Uh, does the panel consider bridge fuels to be a distraction and their associated subsidies to be a distraction undermining the urgent investment needed in renewables? For whom is the question? In particular to the um, to energy representatives. <laughs> yes and no. 
Is that a good answer? Um, we can't just stop using fossil fuels immediately. Um, I don't know if your question relates particularly to shale gas. Um, I am not a big enthusiast of perpetuating the status quo. Um, we need to put our efforts into the transition. Um, keeping the lights on, as I said earlier, um, is a fundamental political driver. No politician is going to survive the lights going out. So. It's a reality that we need to have a, a resilient system, and that includes gas. It doesn't need to include coal or oil, but um, there is a future that is fossil fuel free, uh, and we should we should move there quickly, uh, and not uh, go down diversions like uh, like shale gas, in my opinion, at least. But that future is not uh, will not be so early on the horizon because energy experts claim that, but that by 2050 we will be still using on this planet three quarters of energy from fossil fuels. So I'm a bit worried about the future still. But to wrap up this debate, so I think first, and we all agree that anthropology and other social sciences have an important role in development of new energy solutions, which are not necessarily technological solutions. We have to think about non-technological solutions too. So how to switch mindsets of people in the planet, in different places of this planet. So, conclusion number one. And conclusion number two, uh, we should be proud of our socks and sandals, right? <laughs> so, thank you very much to uh, Sophie Bouli de Lesden, uh, Ben Sykes, Veronica Strank, and Tanya Winter for this debate. <laughs>